Hey, my name's uh, John Enyu. I'm a solutions architect for Decent Online. Uh, we were a development agency uh, based in Canterbury. Um, and this talk is a, a sort of gentle introduction to concurrent programming and concurrency. Um, it's very much about uh, sort of multi-processing um, uh, and, and the command line. And the focus of the talk really is to talk about uh, how we went about um, making migra Drupal Migrate work a bit faster. Um, so, to start off, what is concurrency? Um, so, so, concurrency is the ability to uh, split a program up such that it runs uh, in, in parallel. So, it's adding that kind of level of par uh, parallelization for your application. Um, and there's a number of reasons why you might want to do this, and we'll explore those in a bit of detail um, on the current slides. Um, just to sort of, sort of set the scene for the presentation, uh, this is very much a kind of a Debbie presentation, I think we put it down on the advanced uh, scene. So um, there's going to be a few shots of the console uh, during here. We're going to see some terminal output and there will be some code. Um, so for some people, we'll, and we'll have a sort of a demonstration of migration actually happening as well. So you'll see some scrolling stuff down the screen. Um, so for some of you in the wrong room, this may look a bit like the Matrix. Um, so we're going to look at uh, some of the reasons why you might go about uh, uh, paralyzing an application like Migrate. And, uh, um, and what the, what the benefits of doing that are. So if you've got an application uh, running, so migration is actually running, and it's going to be talking to a lot of external services as it goes through. So if you're running a migration, it's going to be asking from data from perhaps a remote web service, uh, writing data to the file store or reading files from the file store. Um, you might be interacting with varnish cache, clearing caches, um, reading writing to a database, um, writing records to Apache Solar. So there's a lot of interactions that are going on there. And for a lot of the time, the application is sending requests out to these various services, telling them to do things, and then it's sitting around waiting for a response. Um, and it's that dead time that parallelization then uh, improves the speed of your application. So request from the web service, and then it waits as the web service churns that request and then returns it. Um, and a lot of these uh, speed, uh, a lot of the pausing, a lot of the dead time of the application is waiting for responses over the network. So most of these things will be attached over, over network connections to... Um, uh, to your main server and to your main application. Um, so by taking an application which was single-threaded and multi-threading it, while one thread is waiting for a request from the web service, another thread may be sending a, a message to the data store or maybe doing some processing or talking to another system. So yeah, so when you actually run top on some of these things, you actually notice that most of the time the, uh, the server sat around board, so it's not really doing anything. Um, uh, and this is the, you know, one of the main reasons for, for, for paralyzing uh, your application and running co uh, concurrently. Um, so, yeah, so when you come to actually writing concurrent programs, um, uh, you've got to break down the problem. So it's trying to understand how you would might write a single-threaded program in a multi-threaded environment. Uh, and breaking down the problem is the first thing you need to do. So you need to write your applications in such a way that they will, uh, will accept, um, they will run uh, uh, in threads. So whereas if you're traditionally used to writing single-threaded applications, you're kind of expecting things to happen one after the other. Uh, in a multi-threaded situation, um, things may be happening at uh, different times. So you, like I say, you were talking to the web service. Is the web service ready to accept a request or multiple requests? Is the application going to fall over if it tries to write the same thing more than one time? Um, and these things are um, uh, very much around uh, sort of deadlocking inside of applications. So when you have two threads trying to access the same resource, uh, does the application um, work correctly? Uh, will it uh, deal with that kind of concurrency issues? Um, I was looking for a, a, a quote from someone on the internet to sort of see where uh, there's any uh, sort of interesting things out there that people have written about. But uh, uh, this was from a, a paper by Edward Lee, and he's talking about um, the insanity of uh, writing multi-threaded systems and uh, were people saying they, um, uh, they would not be able to understand the programs that they write. And I, I think this is certainly true uh, for, for when you come to actually paralyzing things, is that uh, you start to uh, encounter new problems that perhaps you didn't experience with uh, single-threaded programs. Um, so if you've never done any concurrency work before, if you've never worked in this situation, um, there's a, a paradigm uh, within computer science, and this is kind of an archetypal problem, is the dining philosophers. And um, it, it, if you're just getting into this, and understanding this problem and solving it, um, there's, a, there's a sort of standardized solution to this, um, is, a, is a great way to learn about parallelization and how to work, uh, write concurrent applications. So the, the dining philosophers problem 
which many of you may well have experienced on uh, computer science courses, um, but you have a number of philosophers sat around a table. In front of them is a bowl of spaghetti, and they have a fork to their left and to their right. And a philosopher does two things. He thinks, and then he eats. Um, while he's thinking, he's not interacting with anything else. That's just a process that he's running on his own. But when he eats, he needs to get hold of both the left fork and the right fork, and then he can eat. Um, if he's only got one of the two forks, then he's uh, stuck waiting until the second fork comes available. Uh, and write an application that allows you to deal with the situation where perhaps all of the philosophers pick up their left-hand fork and then none of them can pick up the right-hand fork, you've hit a deadlock. Um, this is the same as trying to uh, get a lock on a variable or on a, on a remote resource in your application. Um, if multiple threads hold locks in different places, the application hits a deadlock and it will fall over. Uh, and the dining philosopher's problem is, like I say, is kind of an archetypal um, uh, way of illustrating this particular problem uh, and the, the solutions are a known one so uh, in terms of this what you would do is get your uh, dining philosophers to always pick up their left hand fork apart from the last one who goes for the right hand fork first uh, and if you work through this in your, in your own head you'll see that that's, it's possible that, that the last one will always fail um, and so the one on his left will always manage to get both resources for the first time and then naturally the program will execute uh, till completion um, so in terms of actually um, uh, what Drupal provides, sorry, I'll just go back to this one. There's a, there's a, a demonstration of how to do this, and I'll, I'll provide some links later on that you can study this in your own time and uh, sort of understand how it works. Uh, and it helps with understanding how um, writing multi-threaded applica uh, multi-processing application works, uh, and also will help you in understanding how uh, a multi-threaded migration will work later. Um, so Drupal uh, Drupal 7 has already got concurrency built into it um, at certain levels. Um, Obviously, when you're, when you're accessing a website, then every time somebody makes a request to the website, that's a new request on a new thread. And so Drupal already handles things such as people writing to, um, uh, pressing save on the node save page twice, so the database level will look after that. And there's a, a function within Drupal call called lock acquire and lock release. So if you need to gain access to a resource, um, you can lock that resource beforehand. Uh, deal with it and then unlock it and within your Drupal code you can check to see if locks are available if locks have been and, and wait for locks to be released and in the code for the dining losses problem which uh, like I say, I'll give the, um, the link for you can see how that um, how that code works so that if you're writing your own parallel architecture you can use some of this um, uh, some of these functions um, the Drush command line tool uh, has within it a, a, a function called Drush invoke process um, it's quite, uh, quite complicated the way that it works, um, but it will accept um, a hyphen hyphen concurrency argument on the command line, which will allow it to run uh, uh, functions in, uh, in parallel, uh, so that a number of threads can be executed on a particular one. But you have to write your Drush commands in such a way that it will accept that and it will understand it. Um, I find that particular function quite difficult to understand because it's kind of mixed in with a lot of other stuff that Drush is doing in terms of site aliasing and other things. Uh, and so the concurrency uh, work I'm going to show you later uh, uh, for multi-threading, uh, multi-processing migrate uh, doesn't use uh, Drush's native work, but uh, builds a, a concurrency um, uh, framework around uh, Drush, its, its own one. And it's, a lot, it's a lot simpler and it's a lot easier to understand. Um, and the final sort of tools that are available for... Um, uh, software developers uh, working with Drupal 7 and Drupal 7 <coughs> tools is that your remote systems typically will already deal with um, um, multi-processing and, uh, uh, and multiple connections. So if you've got a, an ODB table, then you've got um, uh, things that can run inside a transaction so that they can be uh, protected against other things that are running. Um, so the database will naturally sort of lock tables uh, as and when they need to when <coughs> requests come in. Okay, so we're going to look now at making migrate move. Um, this is a, a, a graph of um, uh, the amount of time it, took, it takes to do a, a particular migration that I, um, I've measured with this uh, with this uh, approach. And you see with, with one thread, it's, you're looking at uh, sort of two and a half hours to run a migration. But as soon as you get up to four threads, you've dropped below an hour. And by the time you get to eight threads, um, you've got an improvement that's bordering on about 500% improvements. Um, so you know, it, it, it's very much dependent on your particular application, the way that your migration works, the type of services that it's interacting with, but it's certainly possible to get uh, a doubling of your speed, even in the most simple of situations, just because of the dead time uh, taken in just writing and reading from the database. Um, 
this is just a slide just to talk about why you might do this. Like why, why would you speed up a migration? I mean, if a migration takes three hours, so what? And it takes three hours. Uh, is it worth putting all this uh, additional work on the outside? Which it isn't a huge amount. You'll see, you'll see that later. But um, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's good reasons for speeding things up. I mean, the obvious one, obviously, is reducing the amount of time that it takes. And the knock-on effects of that are that you can discover and fix problems quicker. So it, it might be that the right migration takes so long. I mean, you know, it's not unusual to have <coughs> migrations that can take upwards of a week. Uh, if there's you know, several million nodes to migrate, they may take even longer than that. Um, you might have problems that, that, that can take two or three, you know, even a month to run the full migration. So there's, there's obvious advantages of running it. Um, but even on shorter ones, um, you might only during your development cycles actually test a small subset of the import and you'll never test the full amount because it takes so long to run. And you'll save the full run till the very end, just about a point at which you're going to go live. And that's when you find character encoding issues in the one millionth and one file. Uh, record that you're going to improve across. Um, by reducing the time, you can do test migrations because you know, maybe they'll run over the weekend and you can actually see the results a bit a lot quicker. Um, and it allows you to do um, remigrations uh, for our particular purposes. Actually, this was a regular migration, so it wasn't a one-time thing. This is something that happens quite regularly. Uh, and in such a situation, then you're using migrate to um, synchronize data between two sources, uh, then getting it to run fast becomes important because you want those two sources to remain in sync uh, quicker. Um, so, what, what is the process of uh, multi-threading migration? What, um, there's some code uh, at GitHub. Um, we'll make these slides available, but you can go and get that. Um, there's some blog posts that talk about this as well. But if you, you pull that from GitHub, then you end up with a couple of files. Uh, mt.drush.inc is a sort of multi-threading handler for Drush, and it provides a couple of functions, which we'll look at later. Uh, but you put that somewhere Drush can find it, like sites or Drush uh, for your Drupal 7 sites. Um, you need to be running the latest <coughs> releases of Migrate for this to work. Um, then you need to consider uh, how you're going to batch up your migration so that it will work in parallel. Um, and we'll look at this in a, a couple of slides in a moment, but you need to configure your, your migration for batch migration. It's not going to work out the box. You've got to allow your migration to uh, be able to process um, uh, a certain number of records between a uh, start and an end, uh, between a limit and offset. Um, we then make a, a, um, some custom dr uh, drush commands which are going to execute the migration. And like I said, the full instructions are online and we'll, we'll have a look at that in a moment. Um, so once you put that file in the right place and you're ready to, uh, to make your migration handle multi, um, uh, the multi-threading side of things, um, the first thing you do is within your constructor, um, we need to set it so that it can, it can take a limit and an offset as arguments. Um, so we're going to tell the migration that actually you're only going to, although there might be a million records, you're only going to look at records 0 to 100. And this is what we'll see with the threads and the way that the threads work, because they're going to consume, so the first migration will, will run, will, con will process, threads, uh, process records 0 to 100. The second thread will go 101 to 200, and the third thread 201 to 300. And so all at the same time, if you're running three threads, then you know, the, all, of those threads, uh, all of those records are going to be processed uh, together. Um, another configuration for migrate is that um, you need to tell migrate to always use the same uh, SQL map tables. Um, if you're familiar with migrate, then you'll know um, uh, what, what the map looks, um, what this map command looks like. And if, if you're not, then uh, uh, then this is all fairly relevant. Uh, okay, so that's that was the configuration of migrate to allow it to uh, to work with it. Um, just to jump back to here, I mean, what you do with these numbers after you've fed them in through the arguments is up to you, and it's very much dependent on your particular migration. So you've got to pass these down to your, your handlers that are going off to get the uh, remote data from the, from the endpoints to make sure they're only processing um, records between 0 and 100, for instance. Um, and then you'll build a custom drush command to... Um, actually execute the, um, the migration from the command line. Um, in that GitHub repository, there's, there's, there's this example, um, MTM import, which you can take as a basis and uh, just modify it um, briefly for your needs. But I will go through the code um, just in, in pieces so you can see what's going on here. Um, if you've written Drush commands before, this should be fairly familiar. We're just uh, identifying that there is a Drush command called MTM import for multi-threaded migration import. And it takes uh, four arguments, so it needs to know the migration class, which is your migration class that you wrote for your migration, uh, that you just edited. 
Um, and then uh, it had some optional parameters, so limits. You could put it uh, all in there to just migrate everything. Um, and then the batch size, so this is how many uh, records will each migration thread, uh, each, each process that gets executed, how many will they work on? So if you're working one thread, 500 records a time um, is a fairly typical size. Uh, and then finally, the last, um, uh, the last parameter is uh, the number of threads that are going to be working. So how many processes are you going to actually fork to uh, run this? Um, and and what, the, what the migration code does when you, when you execute this uh, is it will always keep that number of threads running. So as soon as one thread's finished, if there's still more work to do, if that limit hasn't been reached yet, then it will spin up another process to work on the next batch of migration, the uh, next batch of records. Um, so this is the Drush command. So we've, we've uh, defined it with the last hook, and this is the actual command that gets run. Um, don't need to look at all the details inside here, other than that we run this um, last function here at the end of the try uh, catch block, which is Drush thread manager. And this is what's provided by the uh, mt.drush.inc file that we included from the GitHub repository. Um, what this is doing is saying, uh, it's passing the information from the command line into, into it. So how many records are we going to process in total? So maybe we're processing a million records, um, 500 per batch uh, with 10 threads. And then the, the next two commands, uh, so the next two arguments are the names of um, a setup and teardown function which run before a thread is created, we run setup, and as a thread finishes, it runs teardown. Um, starting offset is, a, is an option that you get passed in, so if you want to start a thousand records in, then you can pass that in as, a, uh, as an option. So this is the setup uh, function. Um, if you're familiar with migrate, you can see what's going on here, but what we're effectively doing is creating a new sub-migration class. So we're registering a new migration. Uh, and we're passing in, so this is your own class, and you're creating a new instance of it, and you're passing in uh, a sublimit and offset. So if we're going to run uh, just 500 records, um, then we just look at the first 500, and they get passed in here. Um, and at the end of this, it generates Drush backend generate command, will generate the actual migration command that you would normally run on the command line, which is migrate import. So ordinarily, you'd run migrate import, and you'd say, migrate my migration. Um, what this does is it creates a new migration just for a small subset of the records and just migrates that. Uh, what gets passed is, uh, is a Drush command, effectively, and then this is run by the, um, uh, by the, by the multi-threading uh, handler at the top level. Um, on this page, we're just seeing the teardown function. So once that thread has completed, the class that was created in the setup function is then destroyed. So that class only existed for a short period of time to just migrate those 500 uh, records, and then it's destroyed. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll run the migration now, and you can see uh, what happens. Um, okay, I'm going to run this one. So what we're seeing here is a drush mtm import. Um, so that's the, the, the command that I ran before. mtm example is an example migration class. And I'm passing in three arguments. Um, I want to migrate ten records. Um, I'm ba my batch size is one, so um, the process. So they will, we're going to migrate them one record at a time. And the last um, argument is a one as well, which is I'm going to run it with one thread. So this will take about two minutes to complete. Um, so <laughs> this is just a demonstration to show you. So this is what would happen ordinarily if you ran a migrate on this migration. And so this, uh, the way that this migration class is working uh, is that the Drupal instance it's running on actually has a, a fake endpoint that um, I created in a hook menu uh, class uh, uh, as a hook menu implementation, and it just um, returns uh, sort of randomized data, but it allows the migration to use that as a JSON endpoint, which it then migrates. So I'm just migrating 10 records um, from, this, uh, from this endpoint. And most of the time we're taking, we've seen it takes 10 seconds to migrate each, each record. And most of the time in that 10 seconds is it calling the remote web service. So it calls the remote web service, asks for the, for the data, and then it waits around for the best part of 10 seconds, waiting for the data to come back again, uh, at which point it then writes that as a node to the, uh, uh, to the database table. Um, as threads finish, um, because the limit for the number of threads is one, it sees that there's now a space, and it creates a new thread with the next, uh, requesting the next um, record from the migration endpoint. Um, 
it's a jobs rating two, so we can see we're, we're, eight, we're eight into the process of ten, and there's two remaining now. And it prints out the, um, uh, the, the migration handler, prints out both the speed that it's running at and the estimated completion time, so we should be done uh, in a few moments. And that's it, so it's gone to the last one. So that was ten records migrating. Took about ten seconds per record. Uh, it took 120 seconds. Now, if I change the last figure here from one to four, we'll now run the same migration, but with four threads. And uh, I'm going to give it ten seconds to uh, get through the first few. What we're seeing now is they're completing almost exactly at the same time. Individual migrations are still taking 10 seconds. So there's been no slowdown in the migrations. Um, but they're running now um, in parallel four at a time. And so it's taking 10 seconds to do four records, whereas before it was taking 10 seconds to do one record. So you can already see that most of the time that the system was sat there migrating, it was sat around doing nothing because this has applied no additional load. And so we've gone from 120 seconds down to 38 seconds. And if I double the number of threads again, so we've got eight, eight threads now, uh, migrating ten records. <coughs> so yeah, we're down to 26 seconds. So. I mean, even in this pretty simple example, you can see that there's huge speed improvements that you can get by parallelizing the migration. Um, and there wasn't a huge amount of code written. Uh, there is some thought that uh, you have to kind of give to, um, uh, uh, to writing your concurrent code. As I said, you, you do need to make some changes to your, uh, your um, uh, constructor um, when you are constructing your migration classes um, to allow them to chunk the migration effectively so that it can be run in small batches um, and once you're running as well like how many threads should you run with um, is a good question and there's uh, there's a lot of testing you need to do to sort of understand your infrastructure uh, and understand the load that can be taken not only by the uh, the server the application is running on uh, but also all the endpoints because it may be that your remote web service will fall over if it's asked for too much data um, or as we found, I think is more likely is that your database is the place that suffers the most. So, how many threads should you use? Well, you know there is a limit. The, the graph I showed before kind of showed a tail off around eight threads, and with little speed improvements past that. Uh, you can see it takes 10 seconds to perform a single migration on that one. I mean, we're not going to get it below 10 seconds because that is the total time it's ever going to take to, to migrate a, uh, uh, a record. Um, so. When you come to actually do this, if you are using it, then you ramp up slowly, run with two threads, run with four threads, and monitor your server as you're going. Monitor the load on all the, all the disparate nodes that are uh, connected to this migration. Um, you need to watch um, uh, Solar Database, as I say, and understand that. The top will give you most of that information. Um, there's a few sort of settings we found uh, inside of um, MySQL. If, if you're using Picona, you get a, a quite a good speed improvement. Um, I can't remember quite the numbers on that. Um, but you certainly get a lot, of, a lot more locking if you don't have these options. So if you're not using the binary log, <coughs> these things can be uh, can, can improve your performance quite a bit. Um, these are sort of standard MySQL improvements, but are, they do come with risks. So make sure you do read about those, um, particularly around the binary log. Um, but if you're backing up your database once a day and that's all you're doing, then um, this is fine. Um, you want to reduce the load in your database as much as you can. And one way of doing that is by using alternative caching mechanisms. So rather than using the database for Drupal cache, for instance, use Memcache. Um, and Memcache comes with a couple of settings as well that are worth um, uh, investigating because you can pass over the locking uh, infrastructure over to, um, so the lo locking architecture can be like passed over to Memcache. So it's doing it rather than using database components for doing uh, locking inside of Drupal. Um, and the stampede protection inside of memcache as well ca uh, can help depending on um, the amount of, of uh, data flow that you're getting. Uh, and, and that's kind of it, really. So thanks very much for, for, for listening. And um, if anyone's got any questions, then please. Yes, uh, I'm confused because you use the, the, the tab and the <laughs> um, 
It's his multi. Pr it's his multi processing. Um, so you process. Yeah, it's proc open. So it's, it's, it's all it's doing. Yeah, and we were not running PHP threads inside of this. Uh, yeah, I've I have used the word threads inside of it, but I think there's a, a a strict usage of the word which is should be running within the same application. But yeah. Um, it's not something I've really thought about. I mean, uh, so you, are, these, are these queuing mechanisms where you can kind of chuck stuff on a queue and then process it? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Um, yeah, I mean, we've, I've, I've applied this to the Drupal queue as well, although there is already app, uh, um, items that can do that, but there's uh, stuff that you can, you can do within that. So, yeah, chuck all of your stuff on the Drupal queue and then process it that way. But, I mean, if you've got a million, two million records, I mean, that's, that's quite a weight on top of the queuing system itself, whereas this is kind of managing the chunking of the records itself uh, as it goes. So as a thread dies, it asks the next bunch of uh, records from the from the endpoint. So I mean, it, it is dependent on, on the architecture that you're that you're running on. Um, I mean, Migrate itself doesn't have all of the uh, of the chunking components within it uh, either. So this is still running in its own. Uh, it, it's kind of applying some of this stuff on top of Migrate. Yeah, um, sorry, I mean, this, is, this is a a way of doing this. I mean, there's, 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 I'm sure there's plenty of other ways to <laughs> approach these things. So, so, yeah, I mean, it's good to discuss uh, the alternatives. Um, if you're building it outside of MyGraphics, then you have no fallback strategy. So you're, you're building all the custom code based on queuing. Mm -hmm. At least this way, you started off with the migrate framework. You could build the migration and it would flow. But then by adding the concurrency, it meant that you could then chunk as you wanted to, but if you found that was causing problems, go back to some of the process and check that, and then you have that flexibility where yeah, exactly. you're I mean, committing to a custom queue based on something. It, yeah, exactly. Um, we're, we're keeping this within, you know, uh, depending on your, your, your development strategy and your developers and everything else, I mean, we're keeping this within the Drupal ecosystem as well. So, I mean, all of this is Drupal tools, Drupal PHP. So, um, you know, you're getting benefits there without looking at other technologies, but yeah, I'm sure there are other strategies. Um, n not this particularly because this is very much about forking processes. But I mean, it, if you can, if you can pass off, uh, you know, pr any kind of processing to uh, something else, so it, it's very much about sort of back-end processing. Um, I mean, concurrency is getting, it's, it's been around for a long time, but um, you know, there's more traction. And I think um, there's there's some there's some good stuff in the JavaScript communities about sort of worker threads and, and, and dealing with things of that nature uh, to improve. Page performance. So, if you're building more JavaScript applications, or you're using sort of node blocking uh, backend systems like Node.js, I mean, this kind of stuff starts to make sense. N well, not this itself, but using, making sure you parallelize the, your architecture. Considering that the Migrate API is in Drupal 8 core, has there been any work on moving pieces of it into Drupal 8? Like necessary pieces to make this work in Drupal 8 as well? Yeah, I haven't actually looked at um, wh what's happening with migrating core and Drupal 8. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to, to put some of this stuff in. Uh, like I say, there's a, the, there's Drush has some um, uh, has concurrency capabilities within it, um, although it's, it, as I said, it's not quite as straightforward um, how that kind of stuff works. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it would be obviously of interest to put all that kind of stuff in there and just allow it to work by default without having to kind of wrap or anything else around it. Just following up on speeding up page load, and so in this example, one of the reasons that it's slow is because you're waiting for external systems, and generally if you're, if you're doing page requests that depend on an, an external system, hopefully you could cache that information to begin with, so you wouldn't have to wait the other way. The end user would be sitting there for a while. But you could probably, uh, so if you see React, PHP React, so, I mean, you just talk about caching strategies. Uh, no, so if you do, did want to do this, I mean, hopefully you could cache yeah. it instead. Uh, but if you did want to parallelize things, because you do, for rendering to end users, you depend on external services, and maybe multiple of them as well. Mm -hmm. So instead of blocking and going through them, 
there's a framework called React which implements uh, CommonJS patterns. So you could then, in your in your rendering code, you could say contact these three services at the same time and use a promise to uh, gather them up. Yeah, so you push it all out and then yeah, wait for the request to come back. Yeah, yeah, I mean, all, it's kind of good. It's all kind of good stuff. And I think if you, you know, w whenever you approach a problem like this where you've got a large amount of data to move, I mean, there's lots of strategies that you can use to employ. I mean, this is just one of a number of things you can do to improve the speed of migration. Um, and, you know, I think if you wanted to improve migrations just in general without thinking about parallelization, I mean, you just sort of kind of step back a little while first and say, well, where are the slowdowns in my system? I mean, before jumping straight into paralyzing it all. I mean, this is kind of one, probably one of the last things you might want to do right, in terms of caching your requests. But I mean, if the, the, the slowdown is just because of the time it takes to write to the database, I mean, there's stuff that, that this kind of stuff can help. Uh, here, at the back. Um, there'd be locking dependencies, I imagine. So, I mean, uh, again, you, you've kind of got to th uh, work the threads up and see what starts to happen. Um, we have got into situations where, um, yeah, you can get into locking between uh, saving multiple node types, or if you're saving multiple entity types within it, and then each time those, those, those entities are saved, then the, the tables around them are locked, and if they lock each other out, then they can time out. Um, so, on occasion within the migration code, you might, uh, and it's, this again, it depends on the number of threads that you're running at, and the more that you run, the more of these kind of concurrency issues you'll start to get. So you need to kind of balance your system to a point where you're not seeing any errors. So there'll, there'll, be, a, there'll be a neat sort of sweet spot where you're getting um, significant speed improvements without any concurrency issues. But if you keep pushing the system to its limit, eventually things like the database will start uh, timing out because there's too many locks as it, as it goes through and tries to crab over those, um, the, just the weight of the, the requests coming into it. Um, so, yeah, because particularly with Migrate, you'll be doing a lot of writes to the database, so there will be a lot of locking. Um, but, yeah, I mean, these are things that you kind of have to play with. This, this doesn't, it's, it's not a silver bullet solution in itself. Um, you do have to tune your migrations, um, and there's a lot of work around that. Thanks. So, I think you mentioned there you ported it to the Drupal tier. So, I've got a queue that's trying out to be running concurrently. Is this production ready? Uh, yeah, yeah, first of this stuff we're working on. Um, I mean, we're, we're running uh, a queue. Uh, a queue based processing using this, and there's an example on that GitHub repository. Um, pull that back up again. Is there any plans for the um, include that's currently in the GitHub to join the, the main Drush project? Uh, no, like, like I say, uh, Drush does have its own uh, handling of this stuff, um, and it, you know, I'm not, I, like I say, I'm not entirely sure how that stuff works because it's quite deep and it's quite buried, um, but you can wrap with this quite easily. It's not. Um, uh, it, it's not a massive amount of code to be able to do it, and it's you know you take one of the, you take one of these files and you drop it in your sites or Drush directory, and it gives you uh, that multi-threading manager where you can just wrap a, a couple of uh, a couple of parameters into it, and then yeah if you go to there it will give you the um, the, the, uh, the demo code that you can just pick up, uh, work with, and just change to what you need. I think you'll find that pretty easy to use. Um, but yeah, I know I haven't got any immediate plans to pull that back. Yeah, right at the back. Just rather than the concrete world. Um, so proc open gives you, there's a, there's a PHP command called proc underscore open, and what it gives back is a, uh, is a, is a, is a reference to the process, and you, can, and you can just, you fall asleep in the, in the, in the uh, code, and then you just loop over the list of open processes and see if they've finished, and if they have finished, then you can execute some other piece of code depending on, so you just check to see if there's anything else in the queue, if there is, spawn a new process, add that to the, add to the array. It is it's, it's quite straightforward, um, and if you have a look at the, the code on GitHub, um, I don't think you'll have any problems sort of understanding how that works. It's, uh, uh, 
it, like I say, it is quite straightforward stuff. Are there any other questions? Um, so the queue is just a, a store for the, the jobs that are waiting. Um, Drupal cron can, well, when, when it runs, it just takes things off the queue. One, um, maybe it's got a limit of 100 jobs that it processes. So it will look at the, uh, the next 100 jobs in the queue, and it will process them one after the other on its own. Um, but other processes can pick things off of that queue and execute them. Um, so you're, what you're saying is that you want to run cron from within you know the w get to the to the cron web service then yeah that that will be single threaded yeah, but you can yeah I mean, effectively yes i mean you can you can set up cron such that it will run it runs from drush so you can you can, you can do it that way instead okay <laughs> okay, well, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. So if anyone's got any other questions, then uh, come and meet me at the front. But uh, yeah, thanks for your time.